Good evening, everybody. My name is Juno Njama, as introduced. Um, excited to be here tonight to talk about pneumothorax. It's definitely something all of us have seen or actively managed. So most of it will just, I'll be looking at the chat box to see what you guys have to say. Um, and then as we go along, we will talk about um, the newest updates in diagnosis and management. And I'm pretty sure most of you already know what we're going to talk about. So strap on your seat belts. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. as I'm sure everybody knows, pneumothorax, if we go in terms of like breaking down the language of it all, pneumo, air, thorax, chest. So pneumothorax is when you have air in spaces it shouldn't be. So that's the potential space created by the visceral and parietal pleura. Um, so this could be for many different reasons, yeah? And it causes significant effects due to the pressure of the air onto the lung of the same side. Um, so this could be multiple different types. I'm sure most of us know of the deadliest type, which is the tension pneumothorax. Um, this, um, hi, Wahenya, hi, Peter, Mishuke. Yep, say hi in the, in the, um, so we're all familiar with tension numerals because that's the one that's the scariest for us to manage. Um, so maybe somebody can tell me, how do we manage a tension numerals? How do we, first things first, how do we tell a patient has a tension numerals? Feel free to go into the chat box and just say something. Have we ever seen a patient with a tension pneumo? Or how did we suspect that a patient had a tension pneumothorax? Difficulty in breathing, correct. Eric Wedger, thank you. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yep, so shortness of breath. Um, desaturating, reduce, yes, Thomas Matruma, thank you, Redu reduce breath sound on the affected side. So basically, this is your patient who has a pneumothorax, but is unstable and is about to, if they haven't coded on you, they're about to code on you. They're, you're about to lose their pulse, right? So they would have the, um, they're desaturating, they, they can have tracheal deviation, possibly um, BPs will start going down, down, down. So tension pneumo, as everybody in the chat is telling me, signs and symptoms, it's a clinical diagnosis. So you need to look for all those things and um, act fast. So aside from tension pneumo, your, which is now the unstable patient, you can have a stable patient who has a pneumothorax. So these are the patients who will have either a spontaneous or a traumatic one. Spontaneous is when the patient is just minding their business and then all of a sudden, um, they start having some form of chest pain or um, they start, yeah, they start having some form of pleuritic chest pain um, because there's air in the pleural space. So this can be primary where um, your patient was otherwise well, they don't have any comorbids. Um, like I said, they're just chilling, they're minding their own business. So even in school, we used to be told, these are the patients who tall, thin young men are the ones who will get uh, primary spontaneous pneumothorax. On the flip side, um, spontaneous pneumothorax can be due to underlying lung conditions. So patients who have things like asthma, COPD, um, something that's very common, uh, PCP, pneumocystis gerovici carinae, that those are the those are a subset of patients who can get um, secondary spontaneous pneumothorax because of an existing lung pathology. Um, aside from spontaneous pneumothoraces, we can also have traumatic ones. So traumatic ones are the ones that we uh, always see. So it can be due to us as medical caregivers, but it's iatrogenic. So the patients who need um, central lines, dialysis, catheter, things like that, and you poke the you poke the lung or you're doing a procedure, you poke the lung and then they get a pneumothorax. Whereas non iatrogenic is what we commonly see, the road traffic accidents, the falls, um, any form of trauma to the chest, blunt, more often than not, blunt trauma to the chest can give you a traumatic uh, pneumothorax. 
Okay. That's just a bit of uh, introduction. Um, like I said, warning sign you want to know, is my patient stable or unstable? Because both the spontaneous and traumatic pneumothoraxes can progress to become a tension pneumothorax. Um, so how do we... So how do we manage the tension pneumo? So like we had said, air is entering the pleural space, compressing the lung. So you will have hyperresonance on percussion. You will have decreased breath sounds. Um, as it progresses and the pressure increases, you'll have tracheal deviation. And then since it's all in the, um, the pressure in the thorax and the mediastinum, you'll start having reduced cardiac output because of the venous return. And then your BPs will start to tank and then your patient will start to code. So treatment for this initially, um, we've all been taught second intercostal space mid clavicular line. Um, however, recently um, there were some ATLS guidelines, the tenth ATLS guidelines that were updated in twenty eighteen, which recommended for the area for needle decompression to move from the second intercostal mid clavicular to the fourth or fifth intercostal space just anterior to the axillary line. Um, this, depending on uh, who you <laughs> who you are colonized by and who you ascribe to, so that's more American. The British still maintain the second intercostal at the anterior uh, on the anterior chest, mid clavicular line. So it also just depends on your patient profile. If your patient is a lot bigger and they have more uh, tissues on the side, you might want to try the second intercostal. However. You just need to do what works for your patient. And you need to remember that that is just a short rescue measure. Definitively, you'll have to put a chest tube for these patients. All right. So now that we know what pneumothoraxes are, how do we diagnose it? How do we say, oh, this patient has a pneumothorax? And now we've moved away from the tension. Now we're back to the spontaneous and traumatic ones. So your patient who was um, a Boda Boda rider, got into a collision with a Matatu, is brought in, um, and you're trying, you're doing your ATLS protocol and trying to stabilize your patient. Um, how will we start to think, okay, maybe this patient has a pneumothorax. So you'll have done your airway and C-spine, now you're on breathing. So what, um, what, what do we want to look at in terms of our breathing when we're doing our ATLS uh, protocols? So like the first bullet point says, you have to have a high index of suspicion. So if your clinical scenario sounds like your patient might have a pneumothorax, you should, you should really just look for it and see, is it there, is it not there? Because the worst thing that could possibly happen is you missing it and your patient decompensating from it, right? So you have to have a high index of suspicion. Um, if it's more of the spontaneous type, you want to think the, like we said, the tall, thin um, men. Uh, if it's a patient profile who maybe you have an asthmatic patient has come in an acute asthmatic attack, you've nebulized them, they seem to be getting worse and worse. You want to think maybe, my patient has a pneumothorax. Um, then um, what other subset can we think about? I'll give you an example of a patient that I had. Young female, uh, early 20s, otherwise well, came in with what sounded like flu-like symptoms. So she was having a bit of a cough, runny nose. But the thing that was a bit off is that she had some pleuritic chest pain. So I'm thinking, is it pneumonia? Is it something else? So you take more history. Found out that she had recently traveled um, on a 10-hour flight from a different country into, into Kenya. Um, and after the flight is when the pleuritic chest pain had started. So this is where now I examined my patient. So clinical signs and symptoms. So you have to expose your patient. Anterior chest exam, is it symmetrically rising? symmetrically expanding or not, um, you want to percuss, is it uh, equal resonance on both sides, is one side hyperresonant, because air air will definitely be hyperresonant. Um, then you want to auscultate, are there breath sounds or not? And you auscultate in the different areas of the chest, anterior chest, superior, mid, lower, then lateral and posterior. 
So for this patient, the 20 year old who had had a flight, um, her vitals were perfectly stable. Um, she only had some reduced, minor reduced breath sounds on the upper left uh, lung field. So in most situations, if you didn't listen, I know it's it's very common. Oh, sometimes you don't even have a stethoscope. Someone has told you, oh, they just have flu-like symptoms. It's very easy to just be like, oh, you just have a flu. Take some antihistamine, the rest you'll be fine. But if we had done this with this patient, we would have really missed a big um, red flag. So sent this patient for x-ray and she ended up coming back with a, quite a big pneumothorax. And for her, clearly, it was a spontaneous pneumothorax. So clinical signs and symptoms, taking a good history will make you have a good in, um, a good index of suspicion, will raise your index of suspicion. You'll be able to pick up your red flags in the history. Then when you go on to examine your patients, your clinical signs and symptoms will point you towards a diagnosis and will help you figure out what is the best um investigation for my patient do, does my patient require investigation or not and if they do require investigation which one should we do so that leads me to my next question um what is the gold standard for diagnosis of a pneumothorax please uh chime in into the chat so that we see what you think so how do we diagnose pneumothorax Okay, Albert Mugisa says chest x-ray, thank you. Um, Bubi Mutua clinical findings, Yukabeth, chest x-ray, Doris, chest x-ray, uh, Benjamin, HRCT, Pitimbithe, Pitimbai, Focus, Nelson, clinical exam, ultrasound, chest, okay, great. So those are some ways that we can diagnose, absolutely. All of those are true. Um, Thomas says, you do not require a chest x-ray to diagnose a pneumothorax more clinical okay um so yes all those are modalities and ways that we can yes so from history physical exam absolutely yes that gives you red flags if it's a tension you need to diagnose it at that point it's a clinical diagnosis but if it's a stable patient likely you won't diagnose the pneumothorax 100 percent just on clinical findings right so as as we go along, everybody is right. You can do an ultrasound, you can do an X-ray, you can do CT scan. Absolutely. But the gold standard, the one that says quelly quelly, yes, yes, it is absolutely 100% anemothorax. The gold standard is a CT scan. Absolutely correct, Dennis Mirichi. Yes, gold standard for diagnosis of chest uh, uh, anemothorax in a stable patient is a CT scan. However, how easy is it for us to send our patients for CT scan? Is it always available in all of our centers? Does everybody have availability? Okay, I'm seeing, yeah, zero availability from Carmen. CT is too expensive, not readily available. Absolutely true, yes. So I think it's sometimes it's a lot easier to do a chest X-ray. Um, you will find, yes, this is a CT scan. Um, on the right of your screen, uh, you'll see an arrow pointing to a very black region and a collapsed lung, that's, that's a pneumothorax. That's how it looks on the CT scan. Um, and then depending on the volume, it causes variable degree of uh, lung collapse. Okay, so chest x-ray is likely what we will be looking for because CT scan, we've said, has it got, they're expensive, they're not readily available, um, which is true. So one thing you might want to opt for is a chest x-ray. So this is an image of a very obvious, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible, very obvious um, pneumothorax on the right of your screen, which is the left of the patient. So you can notice that the left hemithorax looks a lot darker than the right hemithorax. Um, let me try to use a pointer. pointer. So yeah, the left hemithorax looks a lot darker than the right hemithorax. And if you're comparing 
uh, across the width of the hemithorax, you can see lung mark is stretching at least two thirds of the way on the right. But on the left, you're only seeing a small gray area, like a third, almost even less than a third of the hemithorax. That small gray area that I'm outlining with my red uh, pointer, that is the lung. And again, it's a very good image because it also has arrows labeling everything. So that's the collapsed left lung. And the black area around it is the pneumothorax, okay? So this is likely to be a large pneumothorax. So for those of us who have done chest X-rays, will we always see a pneumothorax this large? Let's return back to the patient I told you. She'd gone for a flight and then started having chest pain. Um, when she came to me clinically stable, her vitals were wonderful. She was not in respiratory distress at all. Uh, she was saturating at 99. She's unlikely to have a massive pneumothorax like this, right? So um, chest X-ray, while good, if available, use it, yes, but it's not uh, see a must. You can also do other things, right? If we think about uh, the trauma patient we talked about earlier, like RTA, a motorcycle rider got into an accident. You're thinking he has multiple injuries. Um, are we going to be comfortable moving him to a radiology suite? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, for those people, um, again, like with CT scans, is it, are you, um, uh, no, how do I phrase this question? Like the CT scans, how readily available are portable chest x-rays in our different centers? For those who have portable chest x-rays available, just type it in the chat so that I can take a, a quick tally. How many people have seen a portable chest X-ray? When I started my practice, I, I had I had never seen a portable chest X-ray. Our facility did not have one. Um, I can see Jennifer saying we have one, but it got spoiled. Okay, uh, Paul Sudi have one not available. Kiambu level five, uh, daytime only. Oh goodness, come in. What's happening at night? The the portable X ray is locked in an office and forgotten about. Uh, Mutua, we have access to portable chest X ray. Paul Sudi is at Agaka at KNH. Good, Machakos level five. Nakuru PGS has one. Transoya ED does not have one. Okay, great. So if you do have one, excellent, you're doing amazing. <laughs> uh, if you have one and it's uh, it's it's locked in the office, that's quite sad. <laughs> Come in, I see your, your <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, for those who have one, I hope you're actually using it. Yes, burial, only done for unstable patients at Machakos, which is great. That makes very good sense. So for those who don't have a portable chest X-ray, you have an unstable patient and you do not have access to a CT scan, what are you going to do? How are you going to confirm that your patient has a pneumothorax? Mm -hmm. Okay. Jennifer says, if fast, perfect. Miriti Dennis says, POCUS, perfect. Exactly. That is true. So POCUS is one of the most underutilized yet um, most reliable ways of diagnosing a, a pneumothorax, especially in a clinical scenario where you can't necessarily move your patient, number one. Number two, for the small pneumothoraces, because um, X-ray depending on whether your patient is standing upright or lying supine, X-ray can only detect a certain amount of a pneumothorax, right? So um, POCUS is ultrasound, EFAST, POCUS, whatever you want to call it, should be your best friend in the emergency department. So this is what I was saying. This is the patient profile that I was talking about. Um, so I want us to just watch a quick video that will tell us. So 
as much as we know that you're supposed to be using ultrasound, do you know what to look for? Do you know what you're supposed to be seeing? Do you know how to do it? So we'll just watch a few videos back to back because I know also adjusting your eyes to see ultrasound images takes a bit of time. Uh, but I hope this is going to serve as a good introduction that um, will prompt you to learn more about it and go and read more about it, uh, look at more images, do your research about it, and eventually get some courage to actually pick up a probe and try and see, okay? So let me try play my video. Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Avila of 5 Minutes Sono, and this is how you scan a pneumothorax. First, we're gonna talk about which probe you should use for this examination. Your go-to probe should be the linear probe. This probe is great for superficial structures and will give you really good resolution of the pleural line. So we're going to talk about which probe you should use for this examination. Your go-to probe should be the linear probe. This probe is great for superficial structures and will give you really good resolution of the pleural line. In a pinch or if you're at the end of an EFAS exam, the curvilinear probe will definitely work. Now as far as where to actually place the probe on the patient, a lot of sources say to place a probe between the second and fourth rib space. I would suggest going a little bit lower, maybe between the fifth and eighth rib spaces. The reason for this is basically just anatomy. If you have a supine patient, air is going to layer more anterior, and the way the chest wall is built, more anterior is going to be a little bit lower um, on the patient, you know, closer to the feet than the second and fourth rib spaces. So I'd start a bit lower, maybe around five to eight. Now this is what you're actually going to see when you're looking at the ultrasound image. You're going to see some cross-sectional cuts of the ribs. Underneath that, you're going to see rib shadow. Remember, sound doesn't penetrate bone very easily. Your intercostal muscle in between the ribs, skin, subcutaneous tissue, and muscle above that. Then underneath the ribs, you'll see the VPPI, which stands for visceral parietal pleural interface, or you can just call it the pleura. What you're looking at here is you're looking at the relative motion between the parietal pleura, which is on the rib cage, and the visceral pleura, which is on the lung itself. You're not going to be able to tell the difference between the two. And in fact, in a pneumothorax, this white line is still going to be there. Really what you're looking for is, is this line, this VPPI or plural line, moving back and forth, um, left to right on the screen? That's what you're looking for. Some people have called it, you know, ants marching, lung gliding, lung sliding. Really just, is it moving back and forth? Is it sliding? That's the most important thing. And this is what the lack of lung sliding looks like. Notice that white line is still there but it's not sliding, it's not moving back and forth left to right on the screen. You might have a little bit of up and down movement or anterior posterior movement, and that's just because the parietal pleura is attached to the ribs and the intercostal muscles when they kind of pinch, especially when a patient's in respiratory distress, it's gonna cause that parietal pleura to move up and down. But in this patient, we do not see left to right uh, movement of the pleura. And so this patient, you'd be suspicious for a pneumothorax in the right clinical setting. If you find an area of the lung that does not have lung sliding, you can be pretty confident that there's no pneumothorax there. However, if you don't see lung sliding, it does not mean that they do have a pneumothorax. The reason for this is that there are a few other causes of the lack of lung sliding. COPD, asthma, subcutaneous emphysema, and apnea are some of the main reasons. You can also have adhesions and fibrosis, atelectasis, and if you intubate rather aggressively, and cause a right main stem intubation, the left side won't have any lung movement if the patient is paralyzed. Lung sliding is very sensitive for pneumothorax, meaning it's very good at ruling out a pneumothorax. If you see lung sliding in an area, there's no pneumothorax. However, it is not very specific. There is, however, an ultrasound finding that has been thought of to be very specific for pneumothorax, and that's something called a lung point. And this is what a lung point looks like. Notice on the left side of the screen, you actually see lung sliding. That white line is moving back and forth, left to right on the screen. However, on the right side of the screen, you just see that white line by itself without any movement at all. This is a lung point, and this is thought to be very specific for our pneumothorax. This is what you're actually visualizing when you see a lung point on ultrasound. You're putting your linear transducer right at the border of the pneumothorax. So on one side, you're seeing lung sliding. On the other side, you're seeing no lung sliding. If you see this, think pneumothorax. There are a few caveats to that, however. At the border between the heart and the lung and the diaphragm and the lung, you might have a pseudo lung point. And basically what that is, is you're seeing lung sliding on one side and lack of lung sliding on another side. You just have to know where you're at on the body. If you're lateral at the 12th row space and you think you see a lung point, 
consider that that might be the diaphragm. And the same thing if you're looking for a pneumothorax and you're looking at the anterior left kind of upper chest wall and you think you see a lung point there, think about it that there might actually be the heart and the lung coming into view. Now when I'm teaching the sonographic diagnosis of a pneumothorax, I'm almost invariably asked about M mode. You know the whole seashore and barcode sign. I found that this actually confuses me more than it helps me. And in fact, there was a recent study that showed that when you used M mode to, in the diagnosis of a pneumothorax, it actually decreased the accuracy of your scan. So I would suggest not using this. Now for a recap. You want to use your linear probe or whatever highest resolution probe you have. You want to scan in the most anterior portion of the chest wall. Lung sliding is sensitive, meaning it rules out a pneumothorax, and your lung point is going to be specific for a pneumothorax. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, grab your ultrasound probe. Hello, everyone. Look. I'm... Um, see, is there lung sliding or not? Is there a lung point or not? Keep it simple, right? If you're not sure, don't make a decision, right? Try looking somewhere else. Try asking for help, right? Because practice, perfect practice makes perfect. Um, so that's the first video telling us that because uh, normally if you think about your own breathing mechanics, right, when you take a deep breath, there's sliding of the uh, parietal against the visceral. There's a bit of lubrication in between there. So it slides to allow that movement of up, down, up, down, in, out, right? So that motion is visible on ultrasound. And that's what we're mm -hmm. saying as the lung sliding of the pleura. So if you're not seeing that, you know there's a problem. You can't definitively say there's a pneumothorax, but you know there's a problem. You want to correlate with your patient profile. Um, is my patient supposed to have lung sliding and they don't? Because that's where your red flag is. If it's an asthma patient or if you've intubated your patient, you want to ask more questions. And asking more questions means scanning more. Scan and look for a lung point, a pathological lung point. Okay. Just another quick video just to reiterate some of that. Um, so you can see this is uh, the ribs are on the sides. Uh, let me get my laser pointer. So this is a rib. Okay. So uh, at the top of the screen would be where the skin is. At the bottom of the screen is now deeper towards the lung if you're thinking about the probe. So this is a rib right, with a bit of a shadow going down or blackness going down, then there's another rib. And even if you think about it in terms of your anatomy, in between there, there must be your intercostal space, which is bounded by pleura just under the rib. So that's what this bright light line just under the pleura is. And um, if we look at the, the way the video is going, you'll see like it's like something is moving, like there's some static or like some shimmering and a few lines. So that's that's what lung sliding looks like on ultrasound. But again, this is just to introduce, for those who've never seen lung sliding on ultrasound, this is just to introduce you to the concept of it because you definitely will need to train your eyes to see this. Okay, let's go to the next video, same thing. This is an ultrasound clip demonstrating eye lines, also known as comet tails, which are a normal finding frequently seen on lung ultrasound. In this clip, a linear probe is used and placed in a parasagittal orientation along the chest wall, spanning a single intercostal space. We can appreciate the following structures in this image from top to bottom. Subcutaneous tissue can be seen here, our pectoralis muscle, intercostal muscles, and our ribs can be seen bordering our image. Note the hyperechoic surface of the rib with posterior shadowing. The pleural line can be seen here with positive lung sliding. Notice these short hyperechoic lines that are vertical and can be seen emanating from the pleura surface. These are comet tails and are a type of reverberation artifact. You can appreciate that these lines move with the pleura and rapidly fade with increasing depth, usually not reaching more than a centimeter. These are similar in appearance to B lines, however, they are much shorter in length, weaker in appearance, and as opposed to B lines, they do not represent interstitial pathology. 
It is important to note that eye lines or comma tails are seen more readily with a high frequency linear probe and difficult to visualize with a low frequency curvilinear probe. The presence of comma tails is a good indicator that the two pleural surfaces are in contact and excludes pneumothorax in this intercostal space. Okay, again, just to reiterate, look for a rib, a rib, a bright line just below it, and look for that movement or those bright lights coming down. Those are what we call the comet tails. Okay, so um, just to back that up, ultrasound um, has a high accuracy for pneumothorax, especially when it comes to the smaller ones that will not be detected on X-ray. Uh, and still CT is the golden standard, gold standard, right? So ultrasound have been found to have a higher accuracy and has the advantage of being performed rapidly bedside, yeah? So your patients who you, you don't want to move, uh, you can just do a quick bedside EFAST and it has very good sensitivities ranging from 91 to 98, whereas chest X-ray, has a lower sensitivity when it comes to the smaller pneumothorax. So that's why you have such a wide range between 47 and 75. So you can do a chest X-ray and then it says, no, you don't have a pneumothorax. Um, and then you do a CT scan and then you see a pneumothorax. It's more likely that the ultrasound will pick it up than the X-ray. And then also on top of that, there are also the varying patient dynamics of what position is your patient. Most of the ones that you're going to do a portable chest x-ray, they're lying supine. So it's, where will the air collect? If your patient is lying flat on the surface, where is your air going to go? If you have a pneumothorax. Anybody in the chat? Yes, Jennifer. Yes, your air will go up. So towards your anterior chest wall. And remember, what view are we doing with our chest x-ray? We're doing a antero, posterior, posterior, anterior, right? So will you be able to see a black line of air if you're in your APPA views? You're unlikely to see small pneumos like that, okay? So that's why, that's another advantage that ultrasound has over chest x-ray because like we were seeing in the video, for the ultrasound, you're putting it directly over the anterior chest wall. So you're more likely to see the collection of air in the anterior chest with the ultrasound than with the chest x-ray, unless it's like really big. Okay, so that for those reasons, um, in 2014, EFAST was officially introduced into ATLS, and the E stands for extended, so extended forecast abdominal sonography and trauma. Um, to include the thoracic windows to evaluate for any pneumothorax as well as the other things. But yeah, it was based on a study that was done in level one trauma centers in Qatar between the year 2011 to 2013. So it's, it's a very strong recommendation. However, as is with most things, there are a lot of recommendations, but on the ground where we, we might be lagging behind in, in terms of, um, in terms of, putting those things into practice, okay? All right, so this, this is my first take home message, right? Start to acclimatize yourself or familiarize yourself with ultrasounds, especially for um, the patients that you think have a pneumothorax. Uh, and it's a lot easier if you start by looking at images, look at images on your computers, Google some images, have a look even all the images that you will see I have drawn from Google, I have drawn YouTube videos from YouTube, right? So familiarize yourself so that uh, by the time you're practicing, what the what the mind knows the eye will be able to see. Huh? Yeah, the eye will be able to see. So if in your mind you know what normal lung sliding looks like, when you finally hold the ultrasound probe and the screen and you look at the screen, you'll be able to know what am I looking for. All right. So how are we managing our patients with pneumothorax? Again, not tension pneumothorax, just fairly stable pneumothorax. Your trauma patient who is otherwise stable but has like a small pneumothorax, what, have we, what are we currently doing for them? So I want to hear from you guys in the chat. Tell me, how have you been managing your pneumothorax patients? 
Does everybody get a chest tube? Is that what we're doing currently? Again, I'll be very honest. Me, when I was being taught, I was told pneumothorax equals chest tube. I wasn't given any caveats. I was just told pneumothorax equals chest tube. And then I was taught that tension pneumo, first you need to decompress, and then you put your chest tube. So all I knew was pneumothorax equals chest tube. Okay, so what are we currently doing um, in our centers? Okay. Ah, uh, Bethel. Hi, Bethel. <laughs> Depends on the size of the pneumothorax. Okay. Elaborate further. I want to hear your story. Jennifer says they're giving oxygen. How much oxygen to who? Uh, Dr. Kelvin, chest tube, yeah. Uh, Carmen says, depending on the size of the pneumothorax, uh, they do serial chest x-rays. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Bovi Mutua says, given that most will be diagnosed by clinical exam and chest x-ray, it means they are large. So chest tube insertion is what they do. Doris Saidi, underwater still for large pneumothorax. Uh, Dennis Miriti, symptom control. Kennedy Omoya, admit for observation. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, Nelson says, small pneumos are left to resolve on their own, then serial chest x-rays. Large equals chest tube. Okay, all right. Uh, Eric Wedger says chest tube if massive. All right, great. Okay, so mixed uh, responses. Some people are doing conservative. Some people are doing chest tubes. Uh, some people are uh, stratifying your patients based on whether they're large or small. Okay, Frederick says small, stable, asymptomatic, observe and monitor. Wahenya says large. Gets chest tube. Um, you can put picked wow, <laughs> pigtail catheter for smaller pneumothoraces. Okay, all right. So it's good to know what we are currently doing because, as most people are alluding to, it depends on your patient. Everything in medicine depends on your patient. Yeah. So you need to know how big how big is the pneumothorax. Then number two. What symptomatology is it causing? So in 2010, we're in 2024, 2010, there were some guidelines that were released by the British Thoracic Society on management of um, spontaneous pneumothoraces. So um, the first disclaimer, if your patient is unstable or has bilateral pneumothoraces, please put chest strains, okay? Then it further went to um, stratify your patients on whether it's a primary or a secondary pneumothorax, okay? So number one, is your patient stable or not? Number two, what are your patient factors, whether it's primary or secondary? Then number three, how big, okay? The qualifier for how big for British Thoracic Society was measuring the distance. So you do a chest X-ray, you identify that there's a pneumothorax, and then you need to measure, not well, not necessarily with a ruler, but most of them on the uh, system, on the computer system, the distance between the side of the pneumothorax and the um, and where the pneumothorax ends and is in contact with the lung space. Okay, so that's why this image is here. So um, measuring would be, so for, for the Brits, for the British guys, it would be at the level of the helum, okay? So you measure from the, the interpleural distance, basically rib cage to lung. That distance is what we were measuring. Uh, significant was two centimeters. For the American guys, it was from the apex to the rib cage at the top, okay? So since we are doing British uh, Thoracic Society guidelines, we will go with the British way, which is the measurement at the helum. So the significant difference was two centimeters. Okay. So how do we know if it's a primary or a secondary? Like we talked about earlier, does your patient have an underlying lung problem or not? Okay. Um, so 
if they have an underlying lung problem, it is a secondary pneumothorax. If they don't have any underlying, so the young, thin males, <laughs> I promise I'm not being a sexist, but this <laughs> is documented. So the young, thin males who have no underlying lung um, pathology, that would be a primary pneumothorax. And the rationale behind that was uh, that those people tend to have what we call subpleural blebs, little small outputchings of the pleura that randomly burst and then they get the pneumothorax. Okay. So if your patient is more than 50 years old and has a significant smoking history or there's evidence of underlying lung disease on exam or x-ray, so things like hyperinflated lungs suggesting COPD or asthma, um, any signs of like a mnemonic process going on, things like that, those would be your secondary pneumothorax. If none of that is present, that would be your primary pneumothorax. So for the patients with primary pneumothorax, and then you measure the hilum, the interpleural distance at the hilum, if it is more than two centimeters and your patient is breathless, you want to aspirate, okay? Aspirate. Aspiration is using a cannula in the chest and then you pull out the air, okay? Um, so those ones you aspirate and then you reassess after you do that. Usually about 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, you reassess and then you see. You reassess by reassessing your patient's clinical status and you do a repeat chest x-ray because you want to see has the lung re-expanded in the pneumothorax result, okay? So um, if the size is less than two centimeters and your patient is not breathless at all, you want to consider discharge and review your patient in the clinic in two to four weeks with repeat chest x-ray, okay? This was the 2010 guidelines for spontaneous pneumothorax management, okay? Now, because less than two centimeters, there's also, um, I think it's called Co Cochrane, Collins uh, Index. So this is the light criteria. There's also a Collins Index for estimating from that two centimeters, they add up, and then they give you a percentage of the pneumothorax. So less than two centimeters is considered a small one, okay? So these patients, if you aspirate and then on the repeat x-ray, it's less than two centimeters, you discharge or follow up in two to four weeks. But you also make sure you safety net your patients, give them danger signs. If you start feeling chest pain, if you start feeling difficulty breathing, those kinds of things come back immediately. All right, so that was primary uh, pneumothorax. For secondary, um, if your patient has an interpleural distance at the helium of more than two centimeters, or they're breathless, those ones need a chest strain. You have to admit them and put a chest strain, okay? Because it, it's considered a larger one, and then also their complications, your patient is breathless, okay? But if it's less than two centimeters and your patient is, um, if it's, and your patient is not breathless, so you want to know, is it between one to two centimeters? If it's 1.5, you want to still admit. You'll still be more in the conservative, so you give high flow oxygen, and then you observe, and you do serial chest x-rays, okay? But if it is, sorry, that, um, sorry guys, if it's, if it's like less than one centimeter, that's what you do. You give oxygen, you monitor, and admit, okay? But if it is above one centimeter, like 1.5, those are the ones you, Again, you'll aspirate with the needle. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll aspirate with the needle, reevaluate with clinical status and chest x ray. Okay. If there's no improvement or if there's even worsening, you want to admit and put a chest strain. Okay. If there is improvement, you want to still admit but conservative high flow oxygen and observe. Okay. Are we on the same page? So that's what the recommendation was as of 2010. So even since 2010, not everybody got a chest strain. Okay. Up to that point, are we clear? Are we all on the same page? 
Okay, great. Um, so those were the 2010 guidelines. Um, I don't know how many of us have been doing that. I don't know. For me, it was a, it was a surprise <laughs> a few years ago. Anyway, so what should we be doing um, today? So again, the, the same factors of your patient's clinical status, stable or unstable, uh, primary, secondary, those we still have to, uh, we still have to look at, yeah. And then um, recently in 2020, there was a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that was comparing conservative management versus, <clears throat> sorry, one second. So it was comparing conservative management versus um, uh, putting a tube for the patient who has a spontaneous pneumothorax. So I want to play a video for you. Okay. So there was a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that helped compare the two modalities. And this is a quick uh, 1.5 minute summary of what it should Patients with a moderate to large primary spontaneous pneumothorax are usually treated with interventional drainage, which often requires hospitalization, can be painful, and may lead to complications such as organ injury, bleeding, and infection. In this prospective open-label multicenter non-inferiority trial, 316 patients with a moderate to large primary spontaneous pneumothorax were randomized to receive either immediate pleural intervention with drain placement, the interventional management group, or to observation the conservative management group. The primary outcome was radiographically documented complete lung re-expansion within eight weeks with a non-inferiority margin of minus nine percentage points. The primary outcome was met with re-expansion results being similar in the two groups, which produced p-value for non-inferiority of 0.02. Among the secondary outcomes, there was no difference in time to resolution of symptoms. But the conservative management approach resulted in fewer invasive procedures shorter hospital stays, a faster return to work, and less recurrence. Adverse events were more common in the interventional management group and were most often due to complications of drain insertion. The authors conclude that in patients with moderate to large primary spontaneous pneumothorax, conservative treatment with observation alone is non-inferior to interventional treatment for radiographic resolution at eight weeks. Full trial results are available at NEJM.org. Okay, so basically, um, what that uh, study was trying to figure out is, so it it by non inferiority they mean that um, is it worse? You know, they wanted to make sure that the conservative management is not worse than putting a chest strain. Okay, so. They randomized the patients, like they said, some got conservative management, some got uh, chest strain. And from the study, it just showed there's no harm in doing conservative management in terms of waiting till resolution of, or re-expansion of the lung, okay? And some other benefits that were noticed were the fact that chest tube complications were avoided, they had shorter hospital stays and basically patient was able to recover faster in a more comfortable way, okay? So this study tells you that, yes, you can go ahead and conservatively manage your patients, okay? But it's under the caveat that you have to select your patient group appropriately. You can't conservatively manage somebody who will never return to the hospital, you know? You know, those people who come to the hospital one day and then you never see them ever again. You can't monitor the progress of that patient. You can't um, intervene if things go south, right? So it has to be, you have to be very discerning in the patients that you want to try conservative management. Okay. All right. So that's um, one new update. Um, there was something else I needed to say. So yeah, basically. Um, also, if you remember with chest tubes, there's 
it's a it's a very invasive procedure, right? It's very painful. You're putting a whole tube into somebody's chest. You can hurt adjacent structures. You can cause even more damage. You can cause infection and bleeding and all that. So you can confidently try and conservatively manage your patients appropriately. Okay. All right. So um, then now there is uh, another study. Okay. So when your patients have spontaneous pneumothoraxes and are stable, you can manage them in many different ways. Um, per the BM, uh, British Thoracic Society, there's a, there's a section that says to aspirate. Has anybody ever seen aspiration or attempted aspiration of a pneumothorax? Anybody in the chat who has ever seen Aspiration, Carmen has not. Okay, great. Even me personally, I've never seen or done aspiration of a pneumothorax. However, it is possible. And like when you compare, like even with the chest tube, you're also thinking chest tube is a lot more invasive, right? Yeah, so aspiration possibly is an option. Okay, so like we said, conservative management, number one. Aspiration, number two chest strain number three, and then um, somebody had mentioned in the chat, Swahenya had mentioned pigtail catheters. That's another way that you can try and um, help with re-expansion of the lung. Okay, so I want to show you guys a video on uh, how aspiration of the lung is done before we discuss that paper. Okay. This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Pneumothorax refers to the presence of air in the pleural cavity. Primary spontaneous pneumothorax may occur in an apparently healthy person who has no other signs or symptoms of a disease process that may have caused the pneumothorax. Observation and oxygen therapy may be the only treatments that are necessary for patients who have small, primary, spontaneous pneumothorax. However, for patients with pneumothorax and clinically significant breathlessness, active intervention is required. This may include needle aspiration or the placement of a chest tube. This video reviews the techniques and equipment required to perform needle aspiration of primary spontaneous pneumothorax in adults. Ultrasonography can be helpful in confirming the presence of pneumothorax, in locating the landmarks for catheter insertion, and in determining the depth of catheter insertion. Since local practices and equipment availability vary greatly, ultrasound-guided insertion will not be addressed in this video. Needle aspiration is appropriate for patients with their first episode of primary spontaneous pneumothorax. These patients should have no evidence of underlying lung disease and should either exhibit breathlessness or have a pneumothorax consisting of a rim of air of more than 2 cm measured at the level of the hilum. Needle aspiration is contraindicated when a patient has traumatic pneumothorax or when tension pneumothorax is suspected. Hemodynamic instability also constitutes a contraindication. You should also avoid using needle aspiration in patients with underlying pulmonary disease, a history of recurrent pneumothorax, bilateral pneumothorax, or a bleeding disorder. Numerous devices can be used to perform needle aspiration. You should be familiar with the specific devices available at your institution. In this video, we will use an intravenous over-the-needle catheter to demonstrate the procedure. Begin by gathering the necessary equipment. The equipment needed for aspiration includes a 16-gauge or 18-gauge over-the-needle catheter, tubing with a three-way stopcock, and a 50 milliliter or 60 milliliter syringe. 
to administer local anesthesia, you will need 1% or 2% lidocaine, a 10 milliliter syringe, and 22 gauge and 25 gauge needles. You will also need sterile gloves, a protective or sterile gown, a face mask, chlorhexidine or another antiseptic solution, a sterile preparation kit, and a sterile drape. Explain the procedure to the patient and obtain written informed consent. Confirm the patient's identity, the indication for needle aspiration, and the absence of contraindications. Confirm that the patient has no allergy to lidocaine and verify whether the pneumothorax is on the right side or the left side. Place the patient in a semi-supine position with the torso at a 30 to 45 degree angle to allow the air to collect at the apex of the lung. Administer oxygen and monitor the patient for pulse oximetry, heart rate and blood pressure. An intravenous catheter should also be in place. Finally, provide the patient with a face mask. Rub your hands with an alcohol-based formulation and then examine the patient to determine the location of landmarks for the procedure. The preferred location for placement of a needle for aspiration of pneumothorax is the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line on the side with the pneumothorax. Begin by locating the second and third ribs. The second rib is the first palpable rib that can be felt just below the collarbone. Then locate the third rib. The second intercostal space is the area between the second and third ribs. Next, identify the middle of the clavicle and the midclavicular line. The intersection of the midclavicular line and the second intercostal space is the correct place to insert the needle for aspiration of pneumothorax. It can be helpful to mark the needle insertion site with a skin marking pen. Use a checklist to make sure that all the necessary equipment and supplies are ready for use and within easy reach. Put on a face mask, a protective or sterile gown, and sterile gloves. Use chlorhexidine or another antiseptic solution to clean the patient's skin in the area where the aspiration will be performed and position the sterile drape. Aspirate lidocaine into the 10 milliliter syringe for use as a local anesthetic agent. Using a 25 gauge needle, inject a wheel of lidocaine at the superior edge of the third rib at the midclavicular line. Switch to a 22 gauge needle and anesthetize the deeper layers of tissue by inserting the needle at an angle perpendicular to the skin. Before injecting the anesthetic, always aspirate the site to make sure the needle has not entered a blood vessel. Progress with the needle just over the top of the third rib through the intercostal muscles in the direction of the pleural space. This will prevent injuries to the intercostal vessels and nerves, which lie just below the rib. Once you have inserted the needle through the intercostal space, continue to aspirate slightly. When you penetrate the pleural space, air bubbles will appear as you aspirate. Before you remove the needle, note the depth of penetration. You will use the depth as a reference point when you insert the over-the-needle catheter. Connect the over-the-needle catheter to the 10 milliliter lidocaine syringe which should be partially filled with the remainder of the local anesthetic. Stabilize the skin with the non-dominant hand and puncture the skin with the catheter using the same landmarks that you used for the local anesthetic. Continue to aspirate with the syringe, slowly progressing in the direction of the pleural space. Again, when the needle penetrates the pleural space, air bubbles will appear in the syringe. At this point, move the needle forward a few millimeters to allow the catheter tip to fully penetrate into the pleural space. The appearance of air bubbles will confirm that the catheter has progressed into the pleural space.
ask the patient to exhale or cough to prevent air from being sucked into the pleural cavity. Remove both the catheter and the 10 milliliter syringe. Immediately cover the opening of the catheter with your finger to prevent the entry of additional air into the pleural cavity. Attach the tubing with the three-way stopcock to the catheter. Use the 50 or 60 milliliter syringe to gently aspirate the air from the pleural space. Evacuate it through the side port into the ambient air. The correct manipulation of the three-way stopcock is crucial as the connection of a side port to the ambient air will entrap air in the pleural space and increase the pneumothorax. Numerous models of stopcocks exist and you should be familiar with those used in your institution. The three white arms of the stopcock used in this video point to an open side port while the side without an arm points to an obstructed side port with a closed end. When air is being aspirated from the pleural space, the stopcock should be open between the patient and the syringe, but closed to the ambient air. To evacuate the air into the ambient air, you must turn the stopcock so that the syringe is connected with the environment, but not with the patient. Make sure that the pleural space is never connected with the environment while you are turning the stopcock. Measure the volume of the air that is aspirated by counting the number of syringes evacuated. If more than 2.5 liters have been evacuated, the procedure should probably be stopped because such a large volume suggests that there is an air leak. Continue manual aspiration until you cannot aspirate any more air. Remove the catheter, put a sterile dressing on the site of insertion, and order a post-procedural chest radiograph to be obtained with the patient in an upright position. When needle aspiration is successful, the patient's symptoms will improve and no pneumothorax or only minimal residual pneumothorax should be visible on the post-procedural chest film. Most patients are ready for discharge approximately six hours after the procedure if a second post-procedural chest radiograph shows no indication that the pneumothorax has reappeared. The timing of patient discharge will vary according to the institution. Minor complications from needle aspiration of primary spontaneous pneumothorax include localized subcutaneous emphysema. Although serious complications are rare, lung laceration, air embolism, infection or bleeding may occur. You can minimize the risk of bleeding by placing the catheter at the intercostal space just above the third rib, thereby preventing injuries to the intercostal vessels. Technical failure may occur if you cannot reach the pleural space, if the catheter is too short, for instance. This problem most often arises in patients who are very muscular or obese. Aspiration of more than 2.5 liters of air can indicate the presence of a persistent air leak. If this happens, consider the placement of a chest tube. Needle aspiration is an alternative treatment to the placement of a chest tube for patients with a first episode of primary spontaneous pneumothorax. After local anesthesia is administered, the intrapleural air can be evacuated through a large bore venous catheter. The success of the procedure is confirmed by clinical improvement and by a chest film showing no or minimal residual pneumothorax. Okay. So, yeah, basically, make sure you have the proper indications, you risk stratify your patients, make sure they're the appropriate ones for uh, the aspiration, uh, obtain your radiographs, um, qualify the amount, like we said earlier. Um, for the British one, you want to know the interpleural distance. 
uh, whether it's if it's above two, that's a large one. If it's less than two, um, then that's smaller. Um, then you want to also make sure your patient is stable. They're not um yeah they're not unstable they're not they don't have attention anymore and they can tolerate the procedure then you'll use local anesthetic and then you'll um put in your needle and aspirate okay all right great so yeah i left the whole video clear because it was very um well explained um and they're using the british thoracic council uh parameters yeah, that just to note. Okay. So now we go back to this. There's a study uh, that was published this last year called the Expert Study. Um, so it was a randomized control trial that was done in various centers in France. Um, and it's also a non-inferiority trial. Like we said earlier, that means that you're comparing two, two um, techniques of management. In this case, they were comparing simple needle aspiration versus chest tube drainage. And the question they were asking is, um, you want to know, is doing the simple aspiration worse than doing chest tube? Is it significantly worse than doing a chest tube in managing patients with spontaneous pneumos? So they had um, a, a couple of inclusion criteria, and of note, the age was between 18 and 50 years. Um, so it had to be a spontaneous pneumo, patients who come by, who can be followed up for a while. Um, so I'll, I'll let you guys... So it's a, it's on Rebel EM website. You can also go read like the all the details. But yeah, so it was done in France between 20, 2009 to twenty fifteen because they also had to follow up their patients um for at least a year after the initial intervention. So um they recruited a recruited a couple of patients and they randomized them into the two groups. It was a blind um randomization. Uh, and then one group got the, they were explained to how the procedure is and there were, of course, consent was taken. So one group was to get the needle aspiration and one group was to get the chest tube. And just like we've been talking, one of the most important exclusion criteria were patients with tension pneumos and things like that. Okay, so they did the aspiration for one group and chest tube for the other group. Then they were looking at um, a couple of different outcomes. The primary outcome was if after 24 hours, the lung was able to expand and the pneumothorax was able to resolve. That was the primary outcome. And then the secondary ones had to do with after seven days how the lung was looking and then after a year if the if the pneumothorax had recurred and then also based on patient dynamics if they had comparing the pain and anxiety of one procedure versus the other yes so from this trial um doing simple aspiration for spontaneous pneumo was found to be uh, not much worse or else found to be non-inferior to chest tube placement because even um, in terms of like the failure rate, failure to re-expand, 29% of the aspiration group failed to re-expand and 18% in the chest tube group. And when they did the statistical um, relevance in terms of a non-inferiority scale, it was found to be um, not statistically uh, relevant in terms of inferiority. Um, so that also carried forward to seven days and after one year. So the, the margin of difference was negligible. So that's why they said that the chest, uh, the aspiration, simple aspiration is non-inferior to chest tube. And I think um, these kinds of studies have a bigger relevance for like our areas, our low to middle income areas where 
we do a lot of improvisation, right? Sometimes you'll find you don't have a chest tube, but that doesn't mean that you don't manage your patient. So studies like this give you a bit more confidence to try and manage your patient with available resources. Um, yeah, so that was the XPRED uh, study that was published uh, this last year. Then um, there was also, I think this is a good um, study just to mention. Um, it was published in the American Journal of uh, Chest Physicians last year. Um, it's a study that was comparing uh, what modality is found to be better or has the highest utility. And they actually also considered like cost utility um, between a chest tube and aspiration and observation. So from their primary outcome, um, primary spontaneous uh, pneumothorax uh, resolution after initial intervention, whether it was just observing or aspiration or chest tube. Um, and they noticed that the all of them were able to show what's it called? All of them were able to resolve all pneumothoraxes, um, all methods were able to adequately resolve the pneumothorax. Um, then the secondary outcome was like recurrent length of stay, rate of surgical management and com uh, complications. Um, so they noticed that patients who had the more conservative approaches of observation, as well as the simple aspiration, had long, uh, shorter hospital stays than chest tube management, which makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then um, they also compared uh, observation to now chest tube and aspiration. So um, they noticed that chest tube and aspiration had higher resolution without additional interventions. But some of the patients who were just observed and given supplemental oxygen, they progressed into either a chest tube or aspiration. But if you are given a chest tube, you're fine. If you're given aspiration, if you're done for aspiration, um, you tended to have a higher resolution rate. Um, then in terms of resolution, I mean, recurrence after two years, there wasn't really much of a difference. Um, and of course, as you would all imagine, observation was the best utility and lowest cost because you're not really doing much. All you'll do is uh, build a consultation, but no procedures or um, or equipment is used. Okay. So in terms of like patient comfort and patient factors, observation was better. Um, but if you're more afraid about... Uh, your patient progressing or yeah, progressing to surgical intervention, the chest tubes observation was a bit heavy, heavy. Yes. So what does what do all these studies show basically <laughs> now that we've talked about a lot of research? Um so some of our take-home messages. Number one, um, like we said, ultrasound. Please learn more about ultrasound, hands-on approach for ultrasound in um evaluation of pneumothorax, especially for your stable patients. If your patient is unstable or has a tension pneumo, remember that one needs immediate needle decompression uh, and a definitive chest strain. Uh, but yeah, learn to learn to familiarize yourself with what ultrasound looks like and how to use it. Because if it was recommended in uh, 2014, 2018, we should, it's 2024, 10 years later, we should be using it should be and I think it's it's a lot easier to get an ultrasound machine to be brought to the patient bedside than one moving your patient to a radiology suite where maybe you don't even have CT scan or they can't pay for CT scan or even chest x-ray you can't get a portable so ultrasound number one and the studies back it um, number two um, we want to move towards a more evidence-based way of managing our patients, right? So you risk stratify your patient, you quantify um, your pneumothorax. So depending on which one you're using, like we said, the British Thoracic Council, so the interpleural diameter down that's marked B on the screen, if it is more than two, that's considered large. Between one to two is moderate and less than one is small. Um, if you're using the 
American guidelines. It is the apex to cup, it's called cupola. Yeah, so the distance at the apex. Um, so the parameter they use is three centimeters. If it's more than three, it's considered large. If it's less, less than three, it's considered small. Um, but also in in um in tandem with your patient's clinical picture, do they have an underlying lung pathology or not? Things like that. Um, so some of this is still relevant in terms of the 2010 guidelines. Some of it's still relevant, just with a few updates from the uh, New England Journal, the Brown, um, that favors a conservative. It's not too not so consider your conservative management as long as you risk stratify your patients appropriately make sure it's a patient that you can follow up that you can intervene um when needed the ones who will be able to understand what the danger signs are and when to come to hospital and then um for the patients with a more moderate to large so not the ones who are in this um in this study the expert study so do I use needle aspiration? Do I use a chest tube? So again, you still make sure your patient is stable enough for this. Make sure they are, they understand um, what you want to do and they are amenable to it. And then if you can aspirate, go ahead. If you want to put your chest tube and you have proper indication for it, that's not bad either. Okay. But also remember the the cost of all of this in terms of length of stays, complications, um, and money. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay. Do we have questions, guys? Do we have questions? Feel free to put them in the chat up until this point. Um, so as people are chatting, um, there was also a mention of what you call a pigtail catheter. Okay. So pigtail is a smaller, less intrusive way of draining uh, a pneumothorax than a chest tube because chest tube is big and clunky. Pigtail has a smaller footprint. Um, it's a lot more comfortable for most patients. Um, mm -hmm. So currently I've not, I've not been able to um, get a study that compares pigtail versus chest drain. Um, even the expert study, ideally it should have been uh, also had a component of pigtail but it was done all the way in 2009 um so this is an awesome area where you can try and read more about um yeah because it's it's uh it's proven to be um like the slide says less painful for your patients uh the procedure time is quite short as opposed to, to chest tubes and then even the success rate is quite comparable to chest tube. Uh, however, disclaimer, I'm not quoting any studies when I say that. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you do have um, pigtail catheters, in your, if you're in a center where you can put a pigtail catheter, why not? Um, if, you're, if you're in a center where pigtail catheters have not yet been taken up actively i encourage you to read about it and uh, watch a couple of videos yep mm -hmm. okay uh bethel lunani asks uh what's the management for recurrent or persistent pneumothorax so those are the patients who are more likely to get chest tubes uh, because you're also thinking about one what is the cause of the recurrence um, number two, uh, if you also you're also thinking about like how easy it is to do it again and again, right? And then is it just pneumothorax or is it pneumothorax plus effusion? Those kind of things. So those 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 are more um elaborate patients and high risk patients who are more likely to get chest tubes. Yep. Mm. Okay. All right. So Kenneth. Sorry. Um. <laughs> okay. Kenneth asks, uh, in case of supine chest X-ray with a deep sulcus sign, how can we apply the measurements? Um, so 
those are some of the, yep. I didn't um, go much into chest X-ray signs of pneumothorax, but deep sulcus is one of them. Um, so that becomes a bit uh, tricky. However, measurements can be done like in the radiological suite where they try and see the diameter. But also it also depends on is it a, if it's a small one that's causing the deep sulcus or a large one like that. So those are measurements that can be done on the radiograph, um, like in the radiology department on the screen, because you have those, um, what are they called? Those little rulers and stuff that you can use to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Lunani asks for elite athletes presenting with pneumothorax. How soon after resolution can they return to competitive sports and how soon can they travel by air? Okay. So traveling by air is usually a caveat that we give patients who've had a pneumothorax um, because if you think about the, the physics of it all, the cabin pressures, the, the different pressure <clears throat> gradients when you're uh, at higher atmospheric um, levels uh, will will more likely cause them to get a pneumothorax or if it's not completely resolved it will cause re-expansion um, so I'd have to check the minimal the minimal um, flight requirements just give me a minute I will get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. Kenneth, I mean, Michael asks for chest tubes. When do you remove it? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, and I think most people in the chat, maybe you can contribute, but usually it's as it resolves or if it stops bubbling, things like that. So you have to keep reassessing your patient because usually you unclamp it for a few minutes and see it bubbling. Um, then you reassess your patient and then you clamp it. And then like you keep reassessing your patient to see if it's if it's resolved. So if you still have a significantly big chest, uh, a significantly big pneumothorax, you will keep your chest tube in. So I'm seeing for Lunania's question, I'm seeing... Um, a lot of places are quoting two to three weeks. However, I feel like I would want my patient to wait a lot longer than that. But yeah, per, per what I'm finding at the moment, it says two to three weeks. Yep. Um, sorry, please clarify on the device used to measure the distance from the plural, from the ribcage to the lungs for the patients who present with an X-ray film. Mm. For chest tubes, okay, I've answered that one. Um, so it honestly depends. When someone presents with a chest, an external chest radiograph, um, personally what I do, I'd have to like repeat because many patients will come days after, right? So part of your evaluation would be to repeat a chest radiograph, right? So that you can also compare, does it look like it's smaller? Does it look like it's bigger? And then you can use the internal um, ruler on, on your system to measure that. Yep. Okay, let me check the Q&A. Any tips to avoid some subcutaneous emphysema? Sorry, Victor Onino, I don't know what you what you mean. Um, I think the only thing that I will mention about subcutaneous emphysema is it makes your lung focus a bit more difficult. Yeah, that because you won't be able to see past those clearly past those air bubbles. Um, so you might want to try and scan a different area, or if you're getting an inconclusive um, scan, then uh, you might want to go to your gold standard. Yep. So, um, okay, Dennis Mariti asks, is one of the videos needle aspiration was mentioned as a contraind was mentioned as contraindicated intention pneumothorax? 
why is it yet that tension needle decompression is the way forward? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so I'm going to answer it this way. There's a difference between needle aspiration and needle decompression, okay? Needle aspiration is what you saw in the video. Your patient is stable, they're chilling, they have a small pneumothorax that you want to aspirate, okay? You want to actually pull out of their pleural space. That's what needle aspiration is. However, needle decompression is your emergency stopgap measure, your emergency measure where you stick a needle there and it goes, pshush, although most of the time you won't hear that. So those are two different things, okay? When you do your needle decompression in a tension pneumo patient, you're just doing a quick emergency release or decompression, okay? Then after that, you put in your chest tube because it can reaccumulate, okay? All right, I hope that is clear, Miriti. Okay, all right. Um, any other question we might have? But again, guys, please, uh, this is not all the information that there is for you guys to know about pneumothorax. This is only like a, a, a tip of the iceberg, okay? Pneumothoraxes are things that you need to, especially when it's coming from the, the angle of the nuances, like the ultrasounds and then when to aspirate, how to aspirate, all those things. Those are things that you'll have to keep exposing yourself to, okay? So this shouldn't be the only forum where you heard about it the first time or the second time, and then you never try to learn more about it because these are like the, especially like I keep saying in our setting, these are the things that are readily available for us and will make our lives a lot easier and make our patients' lives a lot easier, okay? Yeah, so, and then even like, you can do needle aspiration in, 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 uh, in new units, I'd seen a video where they were resuscitating because in the newborn resuscitation protocol, when you're getting down towards the bottom and you've been bugging for a while, there's a part that says consider new tension pneumothorax. So you can try a needle aspirate that before you even get the appropriate sized um, chest tubes and things like that, okay? So yeah, please keep exposing yourselves <clears throat> keep uh, learning um, yeah so and then keep doing the great job that we're all trying to do okay thank you Evelyn I'm glad you've learned a lot uh, I'm really glad I answered your questions anybody else with a question before we yes uh, Victor Onino asks um, have you had any challenges in diagnosing pneumothorax in patients with underlying uh, COPD or separating the two. Um, yeah, it can prove challenging. Absolutely, it can. Um, so these are the patients where, like in the video about the ultrasound, um, you're more likely to not see lung sliding in the COPD patients. So you will want to interrogate further and look for your other signs of pneumothorax. Yeah, you'll want to look for the lung point, that point where. First half of the lung is moving, the other half is not moving, right? You'll want to look for that pulsatile movement, yeah? So these are the patients where you'll need to interrogate further so that you can get a better, clearer answer. Yep, 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 absolutely. Should needle decompression be a standard before stopping CPR? That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I'll say no, because... Not every patient who undergoes, uh, who, who gets cardiac arrest um, has a tension in pneumothorax, okay? So that's why when you're doing your, um, your CPR, your resuscitations, you need a very quick history to find out the, the most likely cause of the arrest. That's one thing. Number two, uh, one thing that I personally like to do when I'm resuscitating, uh, because yes, tentonium is one of your hips and teeth, you can have somebody auscultate during the bagging to hear if their breath sounds. There's actually a patient who um, had 
had arrested uh, in our ICU was a ventilated patient. Um, so we were trying to, they were previously stable and then all of a sudden they decompensated. So while we were running through our H's and T's, while bagging, we auscultated the chest to hear if the breath sounds are sounding equal on both sides. And we were able to clinically pick it up during resuscitation and uh, do the needle decompression and the patient survived. Okay, another question. Um, uh, if a patient has a left-sided pneumothorax and is known to have a background of congestive heart failure with obvious cardiomegaly, what would you recommend needle aspiration or chest insertion with the obvious risks? Okay, so um, like you remember, the landmarks, so it depends, is the patient stable or unstable? If they're unstable, you want to just decompress. Uh, if there are bigger habitus patient, you might want to try the midclavicular line. You can do that. Um, if that doesn't work, your chest tube, there's a reason why we have a triangle of safety, right? Because you can put your chest tube anywhere in that region, okay? So that's how I'd answer that question, okay? All right. Okay, guys. Um, <laughs> Carmen asks, where do you find pigtails and stopcocks? <laughs> well, they are available. You just need to liaise with your purchasing departments and convince them that they're important. And then they'll get them for you. But yeah, a lot of the the medical supplies companies have those in stock. It's just It's usually just about um whether they think it's a feasible cost or not yep all right i'm seeing very nice feedback i'm glad you guys have learned a lot thank you for sticking with us 